Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Cilium Creator Series. In this session, we're going to be doing a technical deep dive of Cilium, how it works, uh, doing a little bit of an understanding of the packet walk, and all of that, getting into the, some of the details, some of the technical deep dive, the deep dive of Cilium itself. I'm going to start this session off by going through a few slides, taking you through a little bit of a high-level overview, showing you some of the other resources that are available to you to um, explore some of the technical, uh, some of the deep dives into Cilium itself. And then we're going to jump into a kind of a demo and show uh, show a little bit of that live, um, the live part of it. So to get started, I think I want to show you basically where to find more information than I'm even going to be covering today, right? So more great information that is available to you as a consumer, if you wanted to like uh, really dig into it even more than I'm going to really have a time for today in this session. So the first thing I want to point out is if you go to docs.cilium.io, it's a great documentation page. Um, and just down in this section, you're going to find a ton of really great information about how Cilium works, including this section here in the eBPF data path, which takes you through effectively life of a packet. And this will take you through and explain in pretty significant detail, the way that we actually do, um, that we actually handle uh, traffic on an endpoint basis for Cilium itself, right? So traffic moving back and forth between endpoint to endpoint, that's traffic moving back and forth between uh, pod to pod within a Kubernetes cluster or pod to an external VM, those sorts of things. This is actually how we route that traffic back and forth between endpoints how we actually handle traffic on egress from an endpoint, maybe leaving the node, how we handle traffic in, on ingress into the node. It gets into some pretty significant detail. We also talk a bit about uh, eBPF maps, what eBPF maps are used and how all of these pieces are, are used in the, in the product itself. We talk about um, external, uh, we talk about IP tables usage, but a little bit of IP tables we do use, and even that in itself is optional. Um, there's tons of really great information in here for understanding how all of that stuff works. The other thing I'm going to point out is Echo, which is a weekly thing hosted by myself and a few others. Um, within our organization. So Liz Rice uh, started the project. She's hosting it all, uh, all alternate Fridays. And so every other Friday we have our, myself, Liz, Tracy, uh, Bill sometimes, uh, a bunch of different individuals that come in and uh, host individual episodes talking about different topics. And these topics are wide ranging anywhere from anything to do with Cilium itself or anything to do with um, the BPF space in general. So if you want to know more uh, or dig into more detail, this is another really great way to jump into it. Talking about Cilium or BPF in general. Uh, in fact, I just did an episode on Friday that was called Cluster API and Cilium, evaluating different cluster API distributions. And then this most recent Friday, I did a migration episode from open source Calico to Cilium, kind of showing how uh, in Cilium 1.13, we have the ability to actually handle that migration dynamic uh, live in the crew base. So definitely check those things out if you're interested. Uh, and then the last resource I'm going to share with you is obviously if you go to Cilium.io, under the news and media, there's going to be a newsletter. And this is another great way to stay on top of what's actually happening, whether uh, technical deep dives into uh, different function or different things happening in the eBPF space, or even just a link to say, for example, the learning eBPF book that's recently been, um, that Liz just recently published, that will be available to, you know, behind this link, a ton of really great information. So jump into those things if they're interesting to you. Um, and those things are available to you all the time, wherever you are. Let's get into the slides and then we'll jump into the live demo, and kind of show how some of this stuff works. So Cilium is, um, so Cilium is uh, based 
on eBPF. eBPF is a pretty interesting new kernel technology that allows us to effectively um, write native kernel speed, uh, write programs and inject those programs directly into the Linux kernel that allow us to be able to um, in intercept or ma uh, manipulate uh, system calls and other calls to the Linux kernel itself. Um, and that is the premise behind what we've built with Cilium, right? So the idea being that if you know we see, say we're within a Kubernetes cluster and you have two pods that want to communicate to one another, or in this example, if you have a pod and you want, and that pod wants to actually open up a syscall or make a syscall, like a set UAD syscall or a file open syscall, when that syscall happens inside the Linux kernel, it's generally going to happen in the form of an event within the um, within the Linux kernel. And eBPF gives us the ability to instrument that event. So whenever that event happens, we can actually hook into it and gather a lot of context about what happened and actually push that context down to user space. And in some cases we can manipulate what happens with that call before the call is acted on, right? So we can say, maybe I want to restrict this syscall. I don't want processes as defined by some criteria to be able to make this system call. So when that system call happens, when I see that system call coming in, I can actually determine, you know what, I want to disallow this or not allow it and then and uh, and block it from happening. So since this effectively happens on an event stream, this is effect, this is how Cilium um, does its work at, at kind of a low level. When a process wants to talk to another process or when a process wants to open a file, in this example, we can see both like a file-based example and also a socket-based example. So when a process makes a connect call, say that pod is trying to talk to another pod and it makes a connect call to that, uh, extra, that other pod's IP address, we determine that that connect call happened and then we can actually jump in and, and write eBPF programs that ties that tie into these different pieces and figure out like what where they want to allow that you know if these two pods are communicating with one another do i have network policy involved if i do have network policy involved is that network policy allowing that traffic to egress from this pod and go to that pod or is that network policy disallowing that traffic right and we can jump into any of these kernel uh into these any of these attachment points to go ahead and make that logical call right whether that is tied to the network device at the packet layer whether that's a kernel probe or a kernel function, um, we have lots of different mechanisms by which we can kind of tie into this and actually make and do the do the work behind the behind the scenes there. So Cilium, I'm sure all of you already are somewhat familiar with with it, but fundamentally, Cilium is a networking and load balancing solution. It's a CNI for Kubernetes service for uh, Kubernetes. It can support things like uh, Cilium can be installed in a way that allows it to operate on multiple clusters and turn those multiple clusters into a single routing or uh, switch uh, fabric so that all pods can communicate between all of those clusters. It can act as a gateway solution. And then we, and we have um, in those environments the ability to create and enforce network security as well. So with Cilium, you have the you have access to the entire Kubernetes network policy model, but you also have access to a superset of network security solutions, which are like which are aligned with things like um, Cilium network policy. Right, Cilium network policy, for example, is a superset because it gives you access to things like Layer Seven network policy. You can create a network policy that allows for one application to communicate with a service based on um, HTTP verb, right? Like where I'm going to allow application A to talk to service B on, um, but it can only do gets or puts or posts. It can't do a, it can't do a, you know, delete or anything else like that. You can also write network policy with the Cilium network policy that allows for uh, FQDN based policy. So instead of writing that network policy in a way that would require that you have the IP addresses or know the IP addresses or even just the pod labels of both sides of that um, policy, you can also just write network policy that allows or denies based on the um, 
based on the FQDN of the destination. And lastly, the observability. I think in my in my mind, this is probably the most important piece of it. And we're going to jump into like why that is as we go through this demonstration. But the observability capability here actually shows us um, a lot of a lot of information about what's actually transpiring on the network itself. So we can see, and we're going to explore this live, like we can see connectivity moving back and forth between applications within our cluster. We can also see things like DNS resolution for applications within our cluster. We can see uh, at the HTTP layer, we can turn on HTTP visibility and see that layer and, and see that information as well. Very powerful solution. And honestly, I think the observability piece is probably probably the one of the most powerful pieces of it. Back up slide here. So something can apply can be applied to external workloads like external VMs. It can be applied to Kubernetes clusters that are in the on premise or in the cloud or on the edge. And you know, Cilium again can apply either to any one of these things or across the whole set. Cilium Service Mesh gives you the ability to um, have a lot of the service mesh features that you might or solve a lot of those service mesh use cases, like uh, being able to see global metrics, being able to write layer seven network policy, being able to handle things like canary routing, those fun those function that sort of functionality that's available in the service mesh um, feature set within the Cilium product. We also have Cilium Hubble for the observability piece. That's where we're gonna spend a good amount of our time in the demonstration. And then we have, you know, obviously all of the capability of Cilium networking. Over here on the right, we also have a new product called Cilium Tetragon, which gives you the ability to not just operate at the network, but also at the application layer, right? So we can actually show you which process is making a connect call, how much data went by from that process. We can show you if that process spawns in uh, another process with, within the scope of the pod, showing you a lot of the runtime visibility of what's possible. And again, we're kind of available everywhere, AWS, Google Cloud, Azure, Alibaba, OpenShift, VMware, anywhere you want to, anywhere you want to put us, we can actually we can operate Cilium or Tetragon in any of these environments. Jumping a little bit more into some of the detail here. So, giving like some history about uh, you know the problem that uh, some of the some of the history about the problem that we're trying to solve. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about Kubernetes networking, and then we're going to talk about how Selenium fits into that picture. Um, so in Kubernetes networking at a high level, what actually happens is when you create your Kubernetes cluster, you're going to have uh, different sets of nodes, and on those nodes, you're going to have pods that are deployed to them. This could be like the core DNS pod and your application pod that you deployed into a Kubernetes cluster. Before standing up that Kubernetes cluster, you're going to have the ability, you're going to, uh, generally any Kubernetes cluster that you stand up is going to have this function here called kubeproxy, which acts as sort of an internal load balancer for traffic moving back and forth between um, applications within your Kubernetes cluster. And then you're going to have to install a networking CNI. And there are a ton, of, a ton out there, but Cilium is one of the, my, my opinion is de facto standard out there today. With Cilium, we have the ability to be the CNI that you choose for this. And we also, in eBPF, can actually write that entire data plane. We can replace Cube Proxy. There's no requirement that Cube Proxy be, made, um, be available within your cluster. And that means that in these eBPF programs that we create for each individual pod on every node, that eBPF program can handle things like network policy, directly or directly and natively, it can handle things like uh, all of the functionality of kubeproxy, that internal load balancing mechanism that kubeproxy does, we can actually replace that with an eBPF program as well and run at native kernel speeds. A little bit more of you, a little bit more of you into how east-west connectivity works inside of a Kubernetes cluster. The reason that Kubernetes services within um, Kubernetes exist is that it provides a durable abstraction, right? When one application wants to talk, when application one wants to talk to application two, it doesn't actually go IP to IP address. It says, I want to talk to um, application two.service.cluster.local. Um, 
and that and that internal Kubernetes service mechanism is represented by a service IP, and usually in um, most IP most IP tables based clusters out there that are leveraging kubeproxy, that traffic is actually going to be routed back and forth. When the traffic comes from app one and it is destined for app two, it's going to um, a routing decision is going to be made like in IP tables to determine which healthy endpoints are behind that service. And it's going to pick one and route that traffic back to that endpoint by basically doing that, right? It's going to um, it's going to pick the destination. It's going to manipulate the packet so that the destination of that traffic changes from 172.0.2.3 to 10.0.1.11 if I pick that endpoint. And that traffic will then initiate from app one to app two on that layer. With um, an eBPS, with the, the difference in the way that this is implemented, when you leverage cube proxy, this is a linear list and all rules are replaced entirely. So if I added a new service, if I added new endpoints to that service, that means that all of the rules in the Linux kernel would have to be reloaded when that change happens. In eBPF, I can actually make that change just by updating a per CPU hash table, which is a lot more atomic. Doesn't mean it means that I don't actually have to uh, reload all of the rules whenever any one thing changes. I can just um, uh, atomically update a rule that is specific to this particular uh, type of traffic. Significantly more scalable and gives us um, also the ability to affect traffic, even uh, even existing traffic. Right in an eBPF based solution, when you have written a network policy that would that would drop traffic. That means that the very next packet is affected by that drop solution, by that drop uh, policy. Whereas in a cube proxy model, if there was already traffic moving back and forth between those applications, that session will persist until it times out or terminates over time. In load balancing, the same is true, right? So you can actually have uh, a service type, a service type load balancer that is actually going to route traffic back and forth between um, or to attract traffic into a cluster, right? So you have your in AWS or GKE or even in your own on-premise solution, you have traffic that's being attracted to a load balancer node, and that traffic is behind, like say, a AWS load balancer or um, an F5 or whatever. That traffic terminates on that load balancer node, and then we'll um, pass back to uh, pods within a service across different nodes. When we implement this in eBPF, we have the ability not only to uh, accelerate that traffic back and forth um, from the load balancer node, but also that uh, to handle the identity and um, distribution of that load balancing traffic, leveraging eBPF. So in some cases, actually accelerating that with XDP, depending on, on the configuration of Cilium itself. This last piece I'm going to show you, um, and then we're going to get into like some of, a bit of the, the live demo, kind of showing life of the packet and that sort of stuff. So this is another feature of Cilium, and I think it actually also highlights sort of like the life of the packet mechanisms and like what we're able to do. In this example, you have, uh, say, an on-prem or you know, another secure type environment wherein you have a Kubernetes cluster, and when traffic leaves that Kubernetes cluster, uh, it effectively nats out over the IP address of the worker nodes address. And that means that when pod traffic coming from 192.168.1.1 is destined for that external resource, like this legacy database, it's actually going to leave the cluster um, and nat out over the node IP address itself. And that means that any discrete firewall in between that external resource and your Kubernetes cluster is just going to see traffic showing up from uh, the node IP itself. It has no construct anymore of identity. It has no ability to understand that this traffic is actually coming from some specific application. And that means that it becomes very difficult in a legacy environment like this to be able to see and understand like what the provenance of that traffic is. Should I allow it? Should I deny it? I have to make that decision. With Cilium, you also have the ability to do things like egress gateway uh, with a static egress gateway, which allows you to write policy that says, when that traffic leaves from 
this application. Any traffic that is destined for legacy DB by IP or by PDN, when that traffic is uh, matches that particular pattern, I want to manipulate that tra traffic such that we're going to egress out over a, spe or, uh, a specific identified IP address so that just that traffic destined for that external legacy DB will come out over that um, known IP. And now that, and now we have actually uh, given it an identity that continues to work, right? We're able to actually see traffic move back and forth um, because, and, and have some idea of identity for that traffic because it is coming from a known IP and only that traffic that matches that policy will be netted out over that external IP. Pretty useful stuff. We have the egress gateway, and now we're going to jump into some of the live demo here. Play with this stuff. I am actually going to go and look at Q and A here. So let me stop my share for one moment. Take a look at right. Awesome. Great to see folks are enthusiastic in the chat. Lots of really great hellos and lots of great feedback there. We have a QA. We have hands on today. Yes, we do. And does Salim C and I preserve IP? Can we connect to on premise using the overlay? It does indeed. Both of these things are possible with Cilium. Okay, and then let me share my screen. We will get back into the live part of the demonstration. All right, there is one more thing that I'm going to point out to you, another resource that is available. If somebody did ask, actually ask, is it possible for, uh, uh, is it possible, are we going to be doing like live, uh, live work here? And I want to take you to isobalent.com slash labs. Let me get some more water here. I'll be right back. All right, here we go. So if you at, uh, at home or watching this webinar want to explore some of this on your own, if you want to uh, learn more about how these pieces work, but in a hands-on way, definitely check out things like getting started with Cilium, uh, Cil security observability with eBPF and Cilium Tetragon. Uh, there's a ton of really great hands-on labs here in isovalent.com slash labs, wherein you can actually explore this stuff in a, uh, a stand up in, in an environment we stand up on your behalf and learn a lot about how all of this works in a hands on way. I personally like to learn that way, and I do that like every 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 other week on Echo Office Hours. But for the purposes of our discussion today, I'm going to show you a little bit more about life of a packet from the um, from the perspective of actually by looking at like a couple of clusters where Cilium is already installed and we're gonna deploy some applications and we're gonna kind of show how that life of a packet kind of works. Other Q and A questions, does, is Cilium a EBPF a good use case for DDoS countermeasures? Um, it's actually one of the first examples of, of EBPF is the ability to um, limit traffic at that, in, at that layer. And if you think about the way that Cilium actually implements a network policy, right? We can actually determine at the um, kernel layer whether to allow or deny that traffic before it ever hits the wire. So depending on the direction of that traffic that you're trying to block, um, 
sometimes the best, uh, the biggest benefit to us is being able to be as close to the source of that traffic, uh, to drop that traffic in a DDoS way, or the, tra the traffic that's doing a distributed denial of service, trying to drop that traffic as close to the source as we can get. And that, and you can't really get much closer than basically the socket layer inside the Linux kernel from that perspective. I'm assuming that there's no need for ingress proxies as it seems to be relying on programming the kernel. In addition, I would assume no sidecars. That's also true. Yep. Another question is in the last example, we saw the cap we saw the capability to come out of the host with particular IPs that need to be allowed on the firewall. Is this generally done one-to-one -one, and will the firewall route the traffic back to the node? It is because it is still NAT, right? What we're doing is egress network policy so that when traffic is going to egress the cluster, we're going to NAT out over a known egress IP. And that means that when it hits the wire, the um, we're just NATing out over that egress IP and traffic coming back from that external resource is going to come back to that egressed or that um, NATed IP address, be attracted back to the node, get NATed back into the pod application, much the same way that NAT in general works. So for traffic moving back and forth between nodes, is there an encapsulation? And the answer to that is yes. Um, we actually support uh, a variety of options, right? You can um, use a native routing mode wherein you're doing this, or wherein we, um, we presume that the pod IPs themselves are routable and we can actually just make that assumption so that those pod IPs are available on the same L2 segment that the nodes themselves are attached to. We can also announce those pod ciders and attract that traffic leveraging BGP. Um, we also can handle, uh, by, de by default, Cilium will actually use VXLAN as its encapsulation mechanism. So any pod to pod traffic will be encapsulated leveraging uh, VXLAN back and forth between nodes. We all can also support Geneve as an encapsulation protocol. We can uh, support WireGuard or IPSec effectively as the encapsulation protocol encrypting all traffic moving back and forth between nodes uh, so that pod to pod traffic is encrypted on the wire. Can you explain how ID does? As I know, uh, we cannot overlap between IP addresses, IP between clusters and also on to on-premise. Let me give that one some thought. While it's true that um, IP overlap is a challenge, If you have um, multiple clusters, say for example, a cluster uh, cluster one and cluster two, if those two clusters have an overlap in pod IPs and we were to use cluster mesh between them currently, the challenge is that those two uh, pod siders have to be unique. But if you're just using the same uh, pod cider between your clusters and, and you're not doing a mesh between them, that is also, uh, there, there wouldn't be an issue there. If we install Cilium inside a single cluster, we don't have ingress, reverse proxies, service mesh, cert manager, security from other providers. We should not need, we, we have no requirement for any of those things uh, in to operate Cilium itself. As you move into some of the service mesh capability of Cilium, uh, some of those things may, be, may become necessary and things like cert manager and those sorts of capabilities would probably be, uh, would probably be a requirement depending on like what your what features you're trying to turn on or what problems you're trying to solve but you wouldn't need to have a, uh, a sidecar or a service mesh deployed. At the same time, nothing keeps you from deploying those things on top of Cilium, right? Cilium isn't a, um, Cilium doesn't restrict your ability to use your Kubernetes cluster. You could actually deploy Cilium as just the CNI solution handling uh, CNI and observability and the security use cases that a CNI is targeted for, and then deploy Istio or some other service mesh on top, right? So you have options. We consider service mesh to be a feature of Cilium, not necessarily that Cilium absolutely has to provide all of that capability all the time. Last couple of questions, and I'm gonna jump into the demonstration here. Can we define network policy for a custom L7 protocol? The answer is yes. Um, for example, we have, uh, if you go to docs.cilium.io and you look at um, network policy, there's a lot of really great, there's a lot of really great um, coverage there that shows you that we can actually write network policy for anything that we have a 
parse it for us. We can write network policy for things like Kafka. We can write network policy for HTTP. We can write network policy for different types of traffic that we can actually parse um, with Cilium natively. If we have, if we plan to have multiple clusters across different regions, would we have to install Cilium on each of the clusters? Also, would we require a separate network provider such as Aviatrix or would Cilium alone suffice for connecting the clusters? If you have multiple clusters and you're planning on making use of cluster mesh, we currently assume that all cluster, all nodes and all clusters are routable already, right? Cilium itself isn't going to solve the routing layer that would allow for communication to move back and forth between those nodes in multiple clusters. There has to be some mechanism that actually allows for that traffic to move back and forth between those clusters or those nodes within those between those clusters already. And then we assume that once we actually have that capability, we can then join those clusters in a mesh and be, and be able to route that traffic back and forth. But the underlying routing fabric that connects those two clusters is a problem for, uh, for the design of how to actually manage that traffic itself. That said, when the traffic comes from cluster A and is destined for some node on cluster B, we actually can do a bit of a lookup and determine like how to encapsulate tra the traffic back and forth between those things. So you could, for example, determine that you want to do a wire guard encryption for all nodes and all clusters. And that means that when pod to pod traffic would move back and forth between cluster A and cluster B, that that traffic on the wire would be encrypted using WireGuard. And that means that like when we determine that the destination is a node in another cluster, we're able to look up the wireguard key for that node and actually encrypt to that so that we can actually handle all of that uh, transparently to you. That doesn't solve the routing problem, right? You still have to be able to allow for traffic to move back and forth between nodes in both of those clusters, but it does solve things like as long as that traffic's moving back and forth, we're able to encrypt it. Lots of really great questions. For egress filtering, is there a discovery available which domains were visited? Yes, there is absolutely possible to do that. I'm gonna show a live example of that. Currently the transparent proxy of L7 load balancing for Kubernetes services is implemented in IP tables, where it's a traffic marked in the data path. So by default, a Kubernetes cluster comes with kube proxy. And when that happens, that means that the traffic itself is, um, is going to be the internal load balancing mechanism inside of Kubernetes, which is more of like an L3, L4 load balancing mechanism. Uh, that's a leveraging IP tables. I think I, if that's the question you're asking, if, you're, if the question you're asking is more around like how service mesh does its thing, that may be outside of the scope of the question that I think, as I understand it. Perhaps rephrase the question, this last question, and then I'll, and I'll be able to get back into how it works. But for now, let's do a little bit of live demonstration here. All right. So let's take a look at what we've got here. So what I've got in this scenario is I'm actually using cube, I'm using uh, Cilium and I also have a uh, cube proxy deployed, right? So I have Cilium deployed inside the cluster and I have cube proxy deployed inside the cluster. This is a single node or single control plane node. Good. Node, nodes. I have a single control plane node and three worker nodes in this cluster. And then I have another cluster stood up We have um, two different applications, or so we have two different clusters, and they're all um, kind clusters in this case. In this scenario, I'm actually deploying this leveraging Cilium, and I have um, Q proxy deployed. The Hubble UI is stood up, and I also have Hubble Relay. 
And so there's no applications deployed on any cluster yet. So let's go ahead and deploy some applications. Give me one second here. And deploy some sample applications here. Wait for those things to come up here. So this is a sample application just running um, within my Kubernetes cluster. And to give you a little bit of view of what's actually happening at this layer, right? So within Kubernetes, I've made a couple of different deployments here. And when those deployments take place, they're going to be scheduled across different nodes. And so if I were to do dash wide, I can actually see that that traffic is dispersed across uh, all of the different worker nodes inside of my cluster. I have some traffic on, I have some of these applications landing on C1 dash worker, on worker two, and also some of those applications landing on worker three. When the Kubernetes scheduler actually um, determines what a node to associate with a pod, the node itself is actually doing a watch against um, the Kubernetes API server. And when it detects that there's a relationship between itself and work to be done, like say this, Elasticsearch pod or the Kafka pod, anything is like anything like that, then it will go ahead and start to make that pod real, right? So within the cube, the cubelet itself will have seen that there is now work or a desired state to have work deployed to it, and it will go uh, go go about creating the application. It'll pull the image, it'll create a bunch of it'll create the um, and it will uh, interact with your container runtime and actually pull the image and start that image and start creating the network namespace for those things. It will interact with your um, container network interface, or in our case, Cilium, and register a network um, interface and associate that network interface with that uh, with that running application. Cilium at that time actually begins the interesting work, right? So Cilium, as soon as it sees that network namespace, as soon as it's so we are going to request that that network be created, and the request is going to go to the Cilium agent itself. So it's going to see the request come in. It's going to figure out like what IP address it's going to need to give to that pod. It's going to create a VETH pair, one side on within the host network namespace, one side within the pods network namespace. It's going to associate that IP address with that pod. And it's also going to uh, create that first eBPF program that allows us to hook into that socket layer, right? Being able to actually understand that this individual um, application as it gets started up, will actually have that um, Cilium endpoint. So just like I can do kubectl get pods within a given namespace, okay, the tenant jobs namespace, we can see all of our applications running here. I can also do Cilium or kubectl get Cilium endpoints. And as we described before, this Cilium endpoint information is now like basically the kind of the uh, a mapping of the identity and what we know about that particular pod itself. And whether there's any policies associated with that pod or anything else like that can also be made available. But fundamentally, this is just a view of that Cilium endpoint. And if we look at, one of them, you can see a bit more information about what's actually happening at this layer, right? So this is the information that we know about for this particular endpoint. So we understand the container ID, we understand the network namespaces associated with it. These are external identifiers for this individual endpoint. This is the unique identity for the pod itself. And then the, its security identity, 66748, and the labels associated with that security identity. 
Um, and these can actually, these security identities can be used in network policy, right? So you could write network policy that says traffic for um, on cluster C1 within this namespace with these labels, those sorts of things can be used as um, a capability to write network policy for. We've also determined what the IP4 address associated with it is, and we've given it to it, and we know the IP address of the node as well. And then on the policy for this particular endpoint, whether it's enforced, whether it's in an enforcing state or whether the state and what's the state of that is. So I'm going to use the Cilium command line to basically turn on Hubble observability so that we can see the traffic that's actually happening inside this namespace. Ah, oh, I see. There we go. Observe. And this is our first view into that observability capability, right, that we were talking about before. This gives us the ability to see traffic moving back and forth between components inside of our inside of our Kubernetes cluster, inside the tenant job namespace. And if I were to do Cilium bubble UI, we can also see what that looks like from the UI perspective. We can see traffic moving back and forth between pods. This is that event stream that I was talking about before, right? So we can see for every, we can see every, if we can see an event for every piece of communication moving back and forth between uh, pods. And a bunch of the information about that traffic is also available to us, right? Tons more, tons more information, including the source labels, what the destination identity is, what the destination uh, label is in this case it's traffic leaving the leaving the cluster headed out toward the world um, but there's a ton of information that's available to uh, to us at this layer now what's interesting is that we can turn on even more visibility right? we can turn on even more um, even more detail into our view so let's go ahead and do that and show how that works the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and turn on um, DNS visibility so we can actually see those DNS requests go by. Because at the moment, we don't see any um, DNS traffic. I mean, we, we can probably identify that the traffic is DNS traffic because it's destined for port 53. Like this is DNS traffic. It's coming from recruiter going to core DNS as an application. But I want to understand like what that traffic is. I want to understand what it's trying to actually resolve. Um, so let's go ahead and turn on DNS visibility. So this is a Cilium network policy that will apply at the basically at the application layer. And what I'm doing is I'm turning on so it's not like regular network policy. I'm saying egress entities to all uh, two endpoints that match the cube DNS service within the cube system namespace. When that traffic is destined for port 53 on any protocol, I want these rules applied to it, right? Enabling us to basically match on DNS uh, on any pattern within DNS. And that means that we will, we're turning on DNS visibility. We're turning on a parser that will parse all DNS traffic destined from any application or from any application within our namespace to um, 
to the kubedns service itself I put that in the tenant jobs namespace. And now, if I do my same Hubble observe command, I can actually see the DNS traffic in a much more uh, concise way. I can see that this traffic coming from crawler is actually destined for api.twitter.com. And I can see what the DNS resolution itself is, right? I could see that traffic being resolved. And the same thing, if I turn on HTTP visibility, I can actually also see a ton more information about what's actually happening at that layer. So let's turn on some HTTP visibility. These are additive, right? So in this example, I'm actually turning on uh, a parser for HTTP traffic. And that's any traffic that's destined for ports 80, 80, 80, 90, 80, 5,051, 9,200, any traffic that is destined for any of these things, I want to go ahead and turn on the HTTP parser that will allow me to observe that traffic in more detail. Same Hubble observe command. And now we're actually also not just seeing the DNS uh, resolutions for things, we're also able to see Here we go as an example. We're able to see traffic coming from the crawler pod destined for loader. We can see that that was an HTTP post. We can see a bunch of information about that. And the same is true also from our UI perspective. So this is how traffic moves back and forth, and we have a ton of visibility into what's actually happening at that layer, right? Um, and I think, in my opinion, if you're doing a packet walk, being able to see this level of detail, being able to understand not just traffic moving back and forth between pods, but also being able to understand, like, perhaps the destination of that traffic, right? So let's just take, let's take this particular event and understand it just a little bit better. In fact, what I'm going to do is I'm also going to uh, So one more flag here, print node name. There we go. So in this example, we'll just take a couple of events and how to dig into them, right? So this traffic is coming from cluster one and it's coming from cluster one worker three and it's destined for, and, it's kind of, and that's actually traffic uh, landing on this node and moving up into the two endpoint, end, right? It's coming from 10.244.193. It's destined for ten tenant jobs loader pod, the identity on both sides, and then the traffic is being forwarded to endpoint. This two endpoint piece basically shows that this traffic that we're identifying in this layer is actually moving directly to the endpoint itself. Right before it, we have another event that matches a lot of the same information. Right, the source is 10, 240, 240, uh, 10.244.193, and that's the traffic coming back from this endpoint. So two stack, right? Two stack means we're moving back down to the TCP stack. So we have two endpoint and two stack, and there is also a mechanism for showing even more detail around like how what, what's happening at that layer. So that's a bit of a deep dive into how Selim itself operates. Um, I'm going to jump back into the Q&A part of it here, see if you have more good questions for me. Um, I really do recommend exploring this stuff in a hands-on way, exploring the different resources that are available to you to learn more about how Selim works and how, um, and how to uh, kind of learn that in a hands-on way. So there's tons of really great resources out there for exploring this stuff, as I said, if you go to isovalent.com slash labs, there's a lot of really great hands-on labs that take you through this stuff. Um, you can subscribe to our newsletter, 
the Echo newsletter. If you go to psyllium.io and then you go to news and media, there's a newsletter. You can also read our blogs. There's tons of great stuff and tons of great ways to, to, um, to, be, to be connected with us, including at KubeCon coming up in a couple of weeks. We're going to have Cilium Day, where we have a lot of really great folks leveraging Cilium, doing incredible talks and showing how Cilium is solving problems for their for their use cases. Jumping back into the Q&A here. Cilium provides the ability to use a service mesh without a sidecar. In light of the arrival of Istio Ambient, do you have thoughts on this? Whether products will compete or complement each other? <clears throat> I think... With Cilium as a CNI, you can you can deploy any uh, service mesh you want on top of it, right? Cilium service mesh is a feature of Cilium itself, and we aim to express a lot of the uh, capabilities that are to, we aim to solve a lot of the same use cases that people are going to a service mesh to solve with just a feature of Cilium itself. Um, <clears throat> so you can actually uh, the great thing about it is because it's just a feature, you can actually use it. With your with with whatever service mesh is the 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 best one for you and that solves your use case in some in in whatever way that is. Is the kind of Cilium config that you use for your demos clusters available somewhere? It is actually. If you go to the Echo Office Hours GitHub repository, if you go to um, you'll find examples of all of that stuff inside of there. Where does Cilium keep state? For example, if a node running Cilium eBPF program fails, what happens when we cre recreate the node? Who tells Cilium about the desired state? Great question. So Cilium agent actually um, is a daemon set that runs on every node. And that Cilium agent is responsible for understanding the state for all of the entities on that node itself. And it does, it works very similar in, to the way that um, like a cube proxy would traditionally operate, right? wherein the Cilium agent has a watch against this Kuber, the, Kuber, the, the Kubernetes API server. It's also, inter, it's also being interacted with by the kubelet. So as pods come in and uh, get created, we're going to store some of that stateful information, what are the IP addresses that we have associated with this pod in the, form, in this, in the regular way by uh, annotating the pod object with a lot of that detail. But we can also, um, but we also have created this thing called a Cilium endpoint where we hold even more information about that pod, its identity, what the labels are, those sorts of things. And then other Cilium agents within the cluster can parse that data, have a watch on that data and update its own, update their um, stateful stores for information like that. Cilium for the most part holds state in maps, uh, eBPF maps that are available, right? Um, or even in the compiled eBPF programs as things happen, you know, as, as things are created, right? So the identity that's associated with a given endpoint is stored in that EPPF program itself. If a node were to go away, right, then all of the workload associated with that node would also go away, much the same way that we would handle that sort of a failure case in um, leveraging uh, Cilium itself or net leveraging Kubernetes itself. The node goes away, we have to create a new one, we have to like install all of the applications, all of that stuff is all just work that we have to do. A question from Benoit. Uh, is it possible to export packets to the PCAP format and read them with Wireshark? So we do have a capability that uh, we've explored for a bit with it where like, you could actually mirror traffic from a pod and then send that traffic to some collector. And then that collector could basically see that traffic in a, in a, in a, in a packet um, filtering or a packet matching sort of way. The, Stuff that we see in Hubble Observe is not actually meant to be exposed in that way, right? Hubble Observe gives you a, an observability point, but it doesn't. It's not giving it to you in like a PCAP uh, mechanism. Hubble UI is enterprise or OSS. Everything that I've shown you here today is open source. But would you? But you are already able to see DNS. Is this filtering only on DNS? In the Hubble Observe case that I showed you, it was showing you DNS. I was able to see DNS, the, the traffic moving back and forth between the pod and the, the core DNS pod. So I could understand that there was connectivity happening there, but I wasn't able to actually see the payload of that data and understand what's happening. In my rules, I was actually allowing for, I, I wanted to be able to parse that traffic and be able to observe it better 
isn't traffic still going to the service or as I seem to see pod to pod communication. So it is actually, yeah. So if a traffic, um, so the, if you think about it, that pod making a DNS request is actually making a DNS request of the core DNS service and that traffic, uh, but then at that point, it still has to effectively be um, handled by Kubernetes's internal load balancing mechanism. In this case, we're still using QProxy. We didn't disable QProxy and just use Cilium. Although there are examples, I mean, if you want to see that, an example of that, you can go to Echo Office Hours and see that. Um, but um, QProxy is actually manipulating that traffic and we are able to observe the manipulation of that traffic on the other side of the connection, right? So when we see that traffic go by at the socket layer, we're saying, you know, somebody does, so the, this traffic was destined for the coordinates pod. It looks like it's already been translated to a, an individual pod. And that traffic is now something that we can observe at the stack layer, right? We're instrumenting not just the, um, the layer that happens at the pod layer, like when the traffic on the connect call, we're also instrumenting what's happening down at the stack. And we can see that traffic like leaving an interface or coming back into an interface on ingress or egress of the node. That's why we can see that pod to pod traffic, even though the traffic initiated as traffic toward a service. Final question, I think, is is egress filtering based on DNS or is there proxy SSL proxy that is running? So when you decide to implement layer seven network policy, right? The ability to say, I want traffic from these pods to be able to access some specific uh, FQDN. Um, then we are able to observe that DNS resolution uh, wherever that pod making that connection to that FQDN is and associate an identity with that um, FQDN. Writing policy then, or enforcing that policy now enables us to say that when this traffic coming from this pod endpoint is destined for that FQDN or that other identity that we've created associated with that FQDN, we're going to allow or deny that traffic based on what the network policy allows us to do. So this capability of being able to see the DNS traffic that goes back and forth is pretty critical to being able to do things like DNS-based uh, network policy. Is it possible to dynamically turn encryption on based on identities, like encrypt traffic back and forth between service in A and service B, but not between A and C? That is actually a part of the design for the, um, actually, if you go to, You go to isovela.com slash blog. There's a bunch of information about, there was a great blog post that we wrote that showed how, uh, that's the tutorial, a deep dive into how the, um, to how we will handle um, MTLS, MTLS for any network protocol. So there's a ton of really great information in here talking about how MTLS will be implemented inside the Cilium service mesh, enabling you to do things like that. Um, that is definitely a part of the design though, being able to actually do like, you know, per service encryption or not per service encryption, that sort of stuff. Instead of enforcing the CNP, like everything is disabled, can you just run the Cilium rules as testing? Yes, there is an audit mode. It can be done in that way. In fact, there was a great example of that um, at the Kubernetes Security Day. Uh, Liz did a great talk on this, and one of the great um, one of the one of the 
values of this is that because we have that observability capability, we can actually see the traffic. We can understand whether the traffic even has a policy associated with it, right? So one of the one of the metrics that we can expose is whether traffic moving within a namespace matches a network policy. And so you can actually incrementally create network policy and, and understand that traffic within a given namespace either matches or does not match uh, a network policy or any network policy that you've created, ensuring that you can still see like what that traffic is that doesn't have a network policy associated with it, continue to create network policies until all of it is actually matching, and then go ahead and proceed. So if you want to see that one, definitely check out the um, the, one, the talk that Liz Rice did at the Cloud Native Security Day. Welcome, David. I'm just getting started in the container world. I mean, this is a deep dive, and I understand this. It's a ton of information. But uh, yeah, definitely check out Echo Office Hours and welcome to the Kubernetes community.